my channel. So I quickly want to talk about a little rant that I had on Twitter the other day because it involves all of you guys. I really need your input on something um, and it revolves around my channel and an area that I really want to work on this year um, and that is education. So basically if you haven't noticed the past couple of videos I've kind of stuck to a theme of education, whether it is about, um, you know, the different holes and lack of structure and the foster and adoption system that led to a case, or the fact that there is a huge epidemic of missing indigenous women. Um, and this particular case I'm going to talk about today, I am talking about a law that came from an abduction and a murder. I basically feel like a lot of the times with true crime videos, we always speak about cases and obviously getting these cases attention is a major goal but I feel like there's so much more that could be offered through these stories. I've always tried to teach something through my videos, um, whether it's lessons or, you know, we've already already actually gone through some cases where a law has come out of it, uh, such as the Ashanti alert. We're just waiting on the president to sign it right now, I'm pretty sure. Um, but. There's just so much to learn, um, and I've really wanted to cover cases that have changed the way that missing persons cases are handled or how they're seen, um, different you know social issues that either hinder a case. I just really want to spread as much education as I, I possibly can this year because I want you guys to understand as best you can what we are talking about when you come to watch one of these videos. I want to understand it the best I can. Um, so I really want your input. Is there anything you're confused about? Is there a case that you know of that's local to you that created a law that has changed the way missing persons cases are affected? And it doesn't even have to be on a national level. Even if it's local to you, that's a pretty massive change. You guys could let me know down below. That would be absolutely awesome. So now I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into the video. And this is a prime example of something that I really wanted you guys to know about because I feel like every single one of you will know about this registry that I'm going to talk about at the end of this video. You're going to know about the different laws, but it's, it's the story that seems to get lost. And I feel like to understand the laws and why they were put into place, you have to understand what happened behind it. And you have to understand what that person might have gone through and the struggle that everyone went through to force these laws into place to protect further cases just like this. So today I'm going to be talking about the abduction and murder of Drew Shadeen. Drew Katrina Shadeen was born on September 26th in 1981 in Minnesota. She was supposed to live a long and beautiful life, but just like many other innocent victims we've covered on this channel, unfortunately it was cut short at the young age of only 22 years old. Drew grew up in a small town in Minnesota about 200 miles away from Grand Forks, North Dakota, and she was all around an amazing person. She was responsible. She loved school. She loved her family. She loved to volunteer as well. She helped a lot with the underprivileged in the area. She also helped survivors of violence. And when Drew reached her college years, she ended up being accepted into the University of North Dakota in Grand Forks. And she was incredibly excited about this opportunity. She joined the Gamma Pi Beta Sorority, which was something that she was very passionate about and something she had been looking forward to and hoping for for years. She took up two jobs. So again, she was a very, very responsible young woman. She was working at the Columbia Mall in Grand Forks at Victoria's Secret, and she also had a job as a waitress in a bar at night. She had a great boyfriend named Chris. She had plenty of friends. She was doing awesome in school. But on the evening of Saturday, November 22nd, 2003, all of this was stripped away from Drew. Drew was working at Victoria's Secret that day, and her shift ended at around 4 p.m. Right after clocking out, she had plans to go to a store called Marshall Fields to find herself a new purse. And then after she went shopping, she was planning on going to her second job as the waitress. Now, after shopping around for a little bit, I think around 5 p.m., it was time for her to head out, so she called her boyfriend Chris on the phone while she walked to her Oldsmobile that was parked in the parking lot. This was pretty typical, it was something that they did frequently, and Drew seemed in a great mood, nothing seemed to be bothering her, she wasn't off at all, but something strange happened while Chris was on the phone with Drew. About 10 minutes into their phone call, Chris heard Drew say, okay, 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 and then suddenly, 
the phone call ended. Drew didn't seem frantic when she said, okay, okay, okay. It didn't seem like an emergency situation to Chris. So he figured maybe she had to talk to somebody or maybe the connection just went bad. So he figured she would call him back whenever she had better service. But a few hours passed and she hadn't called him back and he wasn't all too worried at first. But then a call came through on his phone from Drew about three hours after their phone call ended and it was not Drew on the other end of the line. All that Chris could hear was a static and what sounded like buttons being pushed on Drew's phone. Now Chris immediately called Drew's mom, Linda, who then in turn called Drew's father, Alan, that lived nearby in hopes that he would go and possibly see if something was going on. Because everyone at this point had a gut feeling that something wasn't right because Drew was very, very predictable. Uh, she always did the same thing. She always called back immediately after a conversation. She never hung up on anybody. She was always in contact with someone. So this was definitely odd. And they knew by the way that the phone call ended, nothing good could possibly come out of that. And this became even more apparent when they found out that Drew had never showed up for her waitressing job that night. So Alan immediately got into his car and he drove to the mall to see if he could figure out what was going on and his heart absolutely sank because when he got in the parking lot, Drew's car was still parked there. But to make it even worse, it wasn't parked in her normal parking spot. So as I said, Drew was predictable. She was like clockwork and she always parked in the same place wherever she went and this was not where she normally parked. The driver's door was locked, the passenger side door was unlocked, which is another thing that was very odd, and some of her belongings that she had bought in the mall were scattered in or around her car. Now I cannot say which one it was exactly. I have seen it both ways, but either way, her belongings were kind of scattered. And to top it off, there was a bloody knife sheath found near the car. Now, obviously, they had already called authorities way before this to report Drew as a missing person, and authorities did come and search everything, but Alan decided to stay in the parking lot near the car just in case, hoping that she would maybe come back, but unfortunately, Drew never showed up. Everyone that knew Drew checked around to see if anyone that she knew had heard from her and yet again they were disappointed to hear that nobody had spoken to Drew except for Chris. That was the very last time anyone had heard from Drew and the media ended up picking up this story like wildfire and spreading it all over, mainly thanks to her loved ones and also thanks to her sorority. Her sorority was reaching out to as many people as they possibly could, different news stations, different higher up people in the TV world, hoping that someone would pick up her story and start throwing it out everywhere possible. They wanted her story heard, they wanted her face seen in hopes that someone would know something and she would be brought home. To top it off, apparently Minnesota and North Dakota, two places I know absolutely nothing about, are very tight-knit communities. Despite being two separate, very large states, apparently there is just one giant sense of community and responsibility there, so not a single person would let Drew's story get out of the spotlight. Even the most of strangers willingly jumped in to help, willingly jumped in to spread her story. Posters were being put everywhere. Everybody in the community knew about Drew and nobody at all was giving up. Drew's family decided to start a website called Find Drew and they hoped this would help as well spread awareness on a international level because anyone would be able to get to this website. They put pictures of her all over the website. They talked about specific physical features, the things that she might have been wearing that day, the things that she might have had on her. And while volunteers from all over spent countless hours searching for Drew, authorities had also hit the ground running. So this is a prime example of a case where literally everybody came together and pushed as hard as they possibly could. Authorities contacted her phone company because after all, she had or someone had used her phone to call Chris about three hours after their phone conversation ended, and they wanted to find out where that phone call originated from. Within three days of her disappearance, the carrier was able to tell authorities that her phone was pinging off a tower near Crookston, Minnesota. Authorities went to areas around this location and shockingly, they were able to find one of Drew's shoes under a bypass. And while this was a great sign that they were getting closer to finding Drew, this shoe paired with the bloody knife sheath 
really likely meant something horrible had happened to Drew and it was very likely that she was no longer alive. Everyone kept searching. Her family came to hand all the volunteer socks and gloves to keep them warm and sandwiches to keep them fed. You have to keep in mind, this is North Dakota and Minnesota in the midst of their winter. They get so much snow in this time and it is freezing outside, but nobody would give up at all. Witnesses ended up coming forward and claiming to have seen Drew giving an older man a ride to his car that day in the mall parking lot. Now, I'm not sure how this person knew Drew was just giving him a quick ride to his car. I don't know how much of this they saw, but this did explain to authorities why her car was in a different spot than normal, but it also made authorities fear that this person, this older man that they thought to have taken Drew, pretty much tricked her into becoming his victim. So they decided to check all of the areas around the mall and Crookston, Minnesota for sex predators and those with a prior kidnapping charge. And by December 1st, which is not long at all after her disappearance, authorities had a suspect. A 50-year-old level 3 sex offender named Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. Now, this obviously, based on his title as level 3 sex offender, was not Alfonso Rodriguez Jr.'s first run-in with the law. In 1974, he committed two rapes, and in 1975, he was sentenced 15 years for those rapes. But only a few years later, in 1979, he was actually released from the sex offender program. So he didn't even have to do the full 15 years for both of those rapes. And then in 1980, only one year later, he had another run-in with the law. Alfonso Rodriguez Jr. in 1980 stabbed a woman and tried to abduct her. And it seemed like history was repeating itself because Rodriguez had been sentenced 23 years in prison for the stabbing and abduction of the woman that happened just a year after his other release. And he had just recently been released for the second time in May, just months before Drew was abducted. They figured Rodriguez was one of the first people they should question. So they brought him in and Rodriguez ended up admitting that he was near Columbia Mall that day, but there was no way he possibly could have done anything to Drew because he was instead at a movie theater. He claimed that he had gone to see a movie called Once Upon a Time in Mexico. So authorities decided to dig deeper in to his alibi and found that that movie wasn't even playing at any movie theater in that general vicinity at all. So his alibi that he had given was false. So they decided to figure out where Rodriguez really was that day and decided to look into his transaction history. And they found that that day he had multiple transactions at Columbia Mall around the time that Drew was abducted. Authorities immediately knew they needed to search his car and ended up finding bombshells in there. There was a knife soaking in some unknown solution in his rear wheel well, in his trunk. So he basically was hiding a knife in the back of his car and attempting to clean it. And to authorities, this wasn't a great sign, especially because there was a bloody knife sheath near Drew's car that they found. They also ended up finding blood splatters all over the back of his car as well. Now, I am assuming they sent all these different things off for testing. I am assuming they checked to see if the knife fit the knife sheath. I am assuming they tested the blood on the knife, knife sheath to see if it matched Drew and to see if the blood spatters matched the knife sheath that also matched Drew. But for some reason, I can't find any information about that at all online. But I'm sure they did send it in for testing, but they still wanted to be able to find a body. On April 17th, 2004, that day came. Linda received a phone call from the command center that had been set up behind a high school and they said that they needed to talk to Linda about something. And at this point, she could tell it was a very different phone call and everyone pretty much knew what was coming. In a drainage ditch near Crookston, Minnesota, Drew's body had been found and it was traumatizing the way in which this young woman's body was left. She was only half clothed, her wrists were tied behind her back, and she had been brutally raped, stabbed, and then dumped. 
she had a five and a half inch cut along her neck and she also had a rope tied around her neck that had little pieces of a shopping bag in it that indicated to authorities that at one point it was holding a shopping bag in place over her head. And her phone was also found near her body, which to me makes me so sick to my stomach because there is no telling what Chris was actually hearing when that phone call came through to him from Drew's phone three hours later. The medical examiner brought her in for forensic testing and couldn't definitely say how she died because of the severity of the attack, but they announced that it was possible that it was one of three different causes of death. Either a major neck wound from the gash in her neck, suffocation from the rope around her neck and the bag that potentially was around her neck, or exposure from the elements. Now, all of those options obviously make me sick, but there is something about the idea that she die from exposure to elements that gets to me the most. It, it opens up the possibility that the person that did this to her committed such a heinous crime and so brutally raped and attacked her, she had a five and a half inch gash on her throat deep enough that it could have been the cause of death and what if she was left like that and instead of dying from that, she slowly suffered and then died from how cold it was and the elements. Like that just messes with my brain so incredibly bad. But where they couldn't get answers with the exact cause of death, they were in fact able to identify the killer for sure. They took fibers and hair that were found on Drew and they ended up being a positive match to Rodriguez. Rodriguez, this man that they had found pretty much within a week to two weeks after her disappearance, was in fact responsible for her abduction and her murder. Now, because Rodriguez crossed state lines from North Dakota to Minnesota, it became a federal case, which is actually what everybody wanted to happen because neither North Dakota or Minnesota allow the death penalty. But the federal government does. The trial was incredibly long, incredibly messy. Um, it received a lot of national news and it was questioned multiple times if Rodriguez was even competent enough to stand trial because no one could really fathom how one person could commit so many crimes, be released and continue doing it unless they had some sort of mental illness. But he was in fact evaluated multiple times and he was proven to be sane at the time of the trial and he was also sane when he murdered and abducted Drew. But despite his denial on September 22nd, 2006, Rodriguez was in fact found guilty of the murder of Drew and he was sentenced to the death penalty at the suggestion of the jurors. It was the very first death penalty case to take place in North Dakota. Even different members of both Minnesota and North Dakota government came forward and said that if there was ever a time for the death penalty, something that their states didn't support, this was it. This is how brutally and horrifically she was murdered and this is how much of a monster Alfonso Rodriguez was because think of how many times he had done this and been allowed to be released and his first reaction within a year was to go and attempt to do it again. Now while on death row he maintained his innocence but he did finally cave and admitted that he was the one that murdered Drew. So it took 10 years almost for him to finally admit what he did. Everyone at this point had gone with very little information on Drew's murder other than what was released in trial and what was released on the news. Rodriguez refused to admit to anything. Um, but now that he had finally aired himself all out, he was letting all of the details fly, which was very, very traumatizing to her family, to the community. Um, can you imagine already having gone through your child's death and, you know, 10 years later when you're still hurting, but you've probably, you know, found ways to cope, found ways to, you know, keep living your life the best that you possibly can and then being brought back down to the nitty gritty of what exactly happened. Honestly, I don't even think there's a proper emotion out there that could possibly describe what that must have felt like to 
her family. I am personally not going into specifics that I've seen because her family has said that they won't even look at the document. At least that's what I have seen, the latest I have seen. They do not want to see some of the details. I can imagine how traumatizing that will be all over for them. But the one thing that I did find that I did want to share is something that could help you guys keep yourself safe. And it's how he ended up picking Drew and pretty much how he ended up picking all of his victims. He said that she was the perfect target. She was walking in a parking lot and she was on the phone. She was not as focused on her surroundings as she was on her conversation. And this allowed him to kind of follow her without her really noticing. And on top of that, she got into the car, put her keys into the ignition, but she had her door still wide open, which just allowed him to get right there and be able to attack her. Now, personally, this is something that I do all the time. I am always on the phone walking to my car, and usually it's, you know, to make sure nobody talks to me or bothers me, but now seeing that you know, something that I think is actually helping me could potentially be, make me a prime target. I would never do that again, especially because I'm also walking with my children. Um, and that's scary. It's scary that he knew so perfectly what would keep her attention away from him. And uh, it just freaks me out. And lately, one of the largest ways that traffickers get their victims is in parking lots, in public parking lots just like this. They wait for you to, you know, turn your back for a second, hop on your phone for a second, not lock your door behind you, leave your door open, just anything that allows you to be vulnerable to your surroundings. So that is like one thing that I want to pound into your brains when you're walking to your car. I also am the crazy person that puts my keys in between my knuckles, um, but just keep yourself safe. That's one huge thing that you guys can take from this video. Now, as I said, Rodriguez was found guilty and charged with the death penalty, and he did in fact admit to everything and gave out many details. But despite that, he still is appealing, and he has appealed multiple times, and honestly, the most recent appeal disgusts me. Um, I think it's sick what his lawyers are doing. When you go in for an appeal, you have to have pretty much bulletproof evidence that either you had a mistrial, that there was some sort of bias, something you know wrong happened, um, maybe a lawyer messed up, evidence messed up, or you have to have some pretty damning evidence that shows that you are not guilty. And unfortunately, the most recent bulletproof idea was to prove that there was bias within the jurors. Now, I understand this approach. I do. I get why lawyers do this. It's their job. However, what I think they did in particular that I'm about to talk about is disgusting. So they brought in an original juror into his appeal hearing and they made her talk about her personal background and hopes that they could say she was biased. So apparently she had worked with troubled youth in the past and she also had been in two different violent marriages that ended in divorce. Can you even freaking imagine being brought up and being forced to air all of your dirty laundry and being shamed, you know, shamed for being in a violent marriage, shamed for trying to help, you know, young children that had, you know, been through a lot in front of a man that so brutally murdered a woman in hopes of getting that man back out onto the streets? I know, again, what their purpose is for doing this, but that is probably one of the most disgusting things I think I've seen a lawyer do in a really, really long time. But I wanna go ahead now, before I get any more angry over that, and talk about the positive things that came from what happened to Drew. And I know that sounds like a strange thing to say, but when something so horrific happens, all you can do is change how it might happen to another person or stop it from happening to another person. And that's exactly what happened here. In 2006, George W. Bush signed Drew's law into effect. 
Now, this ended up setting up the Drew Shadeen National Sex Offender Public Registry, which I am sure every single one of you guys are very aware of the National Sex Offender Public Registry. I've talked about it in previous videos, we all know about it, but we never knew this is where it all stemmed from. So this registry requires convicted child molesters to be listed on a national internet database and they face felony charges if they do not update their whereabouts. We've actually had someone that I've spoken about that failed to do this that ended up being arrested and put in prison for it. It is the very first national online database that is open to the public. Anyone in the public can go onto this website, they can type in their zip code, and they can get a whole list of where all the different sex offenders in their areas live. And on top of that, you guys know that normally when a larger law like this gets signed in, there are little, little underlying laws beneath it, and even those are absolutely outstanding. It also requires that investigators do background checks on any possible adoptive parents, any possible foster parents, which first of all I think is crazy that that wasn't a requirement before, but this just ensured it. It is known as the most sweeping sex offender legislation to target pedophiles. It has given power to the public to understand their surroundings, to understand where a sex offender might live in their neighborhood, that the power to protect our children in a way that we couldn't before that, to protect those that are in the foster system and the adoption system. It makes the minimum sentence for molesting a child 30 years in prison and also a mandatory 10-year penalty for sex trafficking offenses that involve minors. There are so many other things that that law has done and changed. It is so much more than just a registry and I highly suggest you guys go and look into all of it because again these are things that I feel like we all should know and we all should know the story behind and this is something that really helps keep the public safe and something that I really wanted to tell you guys about. The registry offers a mobile app. So on your phone you can download this app and it actually shows a map alerting you to exactly where sex offenders live in your area. So you no longer have to get on the website, look at everything. You can do this for any neighborhood. If you went to a different neighborhood to go trick or treating than normal and you wanted to make sure your children are safe, all you have to do is pop open this app, put in the address, put in the zip code, and boom, there are all of your answers. You know which houses to avoid, you know how to keep your children safe. This is such an empowering tool for the public. That is so much to have stemmed from this case. I do know there were a couple other cases involved in some of the um, smaller laws that were put into place, but I think it's absolutely outstanding what can come from a case, what things can be changed, you know, how we can grow, how we can learn from what happened. And this is why I tell these stories, not only bring awareness to a case, not only to hopefully help spread information that brings this person home, but to also help you guys learn and grow and help the community in general grow. This was a very odd situation where this case was huge and has a ton of information, but for some reason, there's nothing left of it online, which was something that I found to be a little bit shocking, so I had to do quite a lot of digging to kind of get the real story. There is a lot of false information out there, so if you are going to do your own research, make sure you fully go through the research. Unfortunately, Drew was taken from the world way too soon, but hopefully the changes that were made and realized from what happened to her have saved countless, countless individuals ever since then. There is a scholarship in Drew's name set up at UND and a memorial garden in her hometown and I know there were plans to make a memorial garden at the university as well. I don't know if that was ever finished but thankfully the community still refuses to forget about Drew. I hope you learned something. Go and download the app. I have the website for the registry listed down below and it gives you all the different instructions for getting the app. If I can find the app in particular, I will also try to link that down below. But thank you guys so much for listening to this story. But that's it today, you guys, for my video. Don't forget to hit the like button and hit the subscribe button so we can bring them home together. And I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.